For this first part after lunch, we're going to talk about commercial fertilizer and lime products and management. Uh, there's a bunch of things in this sec section that are important in terms of potential questions for the exam, so we'll, we'll try to emphasize those and I'll stick to um, stick as much as I can to that and not tell you a lot of sideline stories, just a few sideline stories. So we're going to review some terminology. I'll look at some common fertilizer materials, talk about what's, uh, what changes we've seen in the last couple of decades, define some common application methods. Uh, a lot of that has to do with can you talk to your client, can you talk to folks about what you're doing, do you have a common vocabulary. We're all gonna look, also going to talk about how you convert from oxide to elemental form. Our phosphate and our pos, uh, potash are expressed in the, in the fertilizer products as oxides. Sometimes we need to know the elemental form. We're going to review very briefly one fertilizer calculation if you have a recommendation. And then at the end, we're going to talk about some liming materials and their important characteristics. So first of all, what is a fertilizer? It's a compound, that means there's more than one element in it, that contains at least one plant nutrient. So ammonium nitrate um, has nitrogen in two different forms. Uh, when it dissolves, it'll be both cationic and anionic. Potassium nitrate is a fertilizer also, and it has two different nutrients in it, potassium and nitrate and nitrogen. But to be a fertilizer, and, and this is all defined legally, fertilizer has a legal definition. It has to contain at least one plant nutrient. Now, no fertilizer material is 100% of any nutrient, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, they all exist in, compa in compounds with something else. Pure nitrogen, of course, as Dr. Tor told you yesterday, is an inert gas, triple bonded with another nitrogen. Um, elemental phosphorus does exist, but it would ignite when it's exposed to the atmosphere. And elemental potassium burns when it comes in contact with water, you know. So, so they're all, as, as we get them as fertilizer products, they're always combined with some other um, element into a compound. This is the first story I'm gonna tell you about. When I took uh, introduction chemistry, um, you couldn't do this anymore. The professor came in, you know, in a big conference, big room about 150 people, and he picks up this stuff out of his bat and he puts it on the desk and it starts fulminating, you know. Uh, that's against health and safety laws now. But he was trying to show how some things aren't stable in the environment. I believe it was potassium. But nice demo, really made an impact, as you can see. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about where we actually get these things in commercial fertilizers, okay? Now realize that prior to the time where we manufactured these things, mined them and maybe purified them, we relied very, very heavily on waste products. And um, people have known, humans have known for um, millennia that certain things help crop production. But you can go back and read the Greek literature or the Roman literature. If you've read Chinese, you can probably read that and see that they all knew that certain things enhance crop production in certain places. And I happened to take Latin form and I read Virgil's Georgics, trust me, they knew a lot about agronomy, okay? Um, but they didn't know why, you know, elements weren't discovered yet. They just knew that certain things helped. Wheat grew better if it followed a legume, they knew that. They knew the crops grew better on battlefields. Sad, right? They knew that certain manures at the same quantity were better at producing crops than others, right? All that stuff is in literature that's 2,500 years old. But where do we get the commercial stuff now? Well, we get our nitrogen from the atmosphere, and I'll give you some more detail on that in a minute. We get our phosphorus from rock phosphates. So this is a mined material. Phosphorus minerals exist in rocks throughout the world, and I'll show you a map in a minute. And potassium, too, is, is from, the, um, from the earth. Okay? So we get our nitrogen from the atmosphere, and we get our phosphorus and our potassium from mined products. Now, nitrogen fertilizer, again, the Haber-Bosch process. I have an entire book on this, and there's an even better one. If you like the history of things and you like to know how we got where we are today, Baklav Schmiel's book, Enriching the Earth, was, uh, was what I thought one of the best um, agricultural history books I'd ever gotten my hands on, until Thomas Heger wrote The Alchemy of Air. Both of these books are fascinating in terms of what they tell you about the history of nitrogen, nitrogen production. Both Haber and Bosch got Nobel Prizes for the work they did, Haber for fine-tuning the process, Bosch for taking it up to a commercial scale. Haber was a chemist, Bosch was a chemist and an engineer. Anyway, it revolutionized a number of things. It revolutionized food production. And you saw that graph yesterday. Population's gone up as nitrogen fertilizer's gone up. We were on the verge of starvation in the, in the late um, 1800s. 
There's actually a famous scientist, Dr. Crook, that said, look, we got to have more nitrogen or we're going to have starvation. They were looking at the population increases with the Industrial Revolution and they knew food production was kind of tapping out. And they were afraid people were going to starve. Right? So it also revolutionized high pressure chemical engineering because all these these uh, corrosion resistant high pressure vessels that Bosch and his team came up with, they patented them, but eventually other companies were able to get uh, their hands on them, because he worked for BASF, they had enough of their own, um, to basically change the whole scale of that engineering for, for the next, for the rest of the world. And obviously, as, as um, Dr. Tor mentioned yesterday, Haber wasn't interested in feeding more people. Haber was interested in making the wherewithal where his country could make armaments. And having the ammonia and then the nitrate that can be converted from it allowed World War I to go on long after it would have, um, it would have had Germany been limited by their supply up to that point in time. So there's just incredible history around this and incredible impact even today. At any rate, <coughs> The companies that do it now, the places that do it now, um, manufacture ammonia. That's the first thing that's produced when, when nitrogen fertilizer is made at very high temperatures, somewhere between 750 to 900 F, depending upon the factory and the process they use. Also, extremely high pressure, 200 to 250 bars. Very hot, very high pressure. Okay. The source of hydrogen in this reaction is natural gas, so the natural gas has to be cracked, the nitrogen has to be purified, because the oxygen in our atmosphere would, would poison the catalyst. All right, so let's talk about phosphorus. Remember, we got our phosphorus from rock phosphates. There are deposits all over the place. We've got still have some in Florida, we have some in other places. Uh, this just shows where there is a resource that could be exploited. It doesn't mean that it's being actively mined now. Some of the deposits are igneous uh, rocks, some of them are sedimentary rocks. There's a huge difference in um, reactivity and fat availability. Basically, no rock phosphate is a great source of nutrients. They're, you know, they're secondary and primary minerals. They're not very available, so they have to be uh, processed. Phosphorus has an interesting story, too, probably as interesting as um, as nitrogen. Um, there's a lot of concern now. You may have read some articles on something called peak phosphorus. You know, peak oil, peak phosphorus. Do you know either of those things? Peak means we've reached the max of our easily available resources and we're on the downslide. When you're on the downslide, it may impact prices, availability, whatever. Okay. There's some people that think we've reached uh, and surpassed peak phosphorus and we're ultimately running out. The United States has 25 years of reserves. We're actually buying most of our phosphorus in the international market now and conserving what we have here. Most of the world's known reserves are in Morocco, but they're in a part of Morocco that they took over from the native people, the Berbers, and occasionally there's these revolutions or thoughts of revolutions or whatever. So the concern is there could, have, could be um, you know, instability, political instability over there that might put the uh, phosphate mines in a part of that country which they no longer have the control over that they have now. Uh, and right now we are importing most of it. Now you might wonder why we worry. Can't we be friends with Morocco? Can't we get what we need from Morocco? And that leads us to the potassium story. Okay. Right now, um, most of the potassium in the world um, is, is uh, especially in North America and South America, comes from Canada, although other countries have supplies too. The deposits were first discovered in uh, Germany. Prior to that, people literally leached potassium out of plant material. <laughs> Potash. Potash, again, is another thing that goes back in history. Um, as early as several hundred um, AD, people talked about leaching stuff from plants and using it to make glass or make soap. They were probably talking about potassium. Again, no one knew what the elements were then, but people have known about potassium for a long time. But it was gotten by leaching plant material. And that's a really important thing in America because when, remember, this was forested. Eastern North America was forested and people wanted to farm and clear it so they cut down the trees. Well, it turned out that you could cut down the trees, burn them and leach the ash and make enough money to hire someone to cut down the next acre of trees. Ash, leached ash, pot ash, the ash in a pot after leaching plant material or, or wood ash was that valuable. Probably for soap and glass, you know, but also had some fertility uses even then. People had realized it. So anyway, the first deposits of potassium um, ore were discovered in Germany. This is before Germany was unified. I don't know what state it was discovered in, despite the fact of my German heritage. I don't know history that well. But anyway, it was a sodium chloride mine. 
underground mine. And uh, the miners realized that, that the vein they were mining was kind of running out and they were running into something else. And fortunately, someone had the intelligence to say, well, what are we running into? <laughs> and it turns out that they were moving from a sodium chloride part of the deposit to a potassium chloride deposit. Voila! This was the first high concentration potassium chloride deposit found. And it, again, it was found by accident and, and found because it, someone had their eyes open and realized, wait, wait a minute, this might not be the sodium chloride we want, but it's the potassium chloride no one's ever found in such a pure form before. So they controlled the market for a long time. Uh, potassium wasn't discovered in, um, um, in the United States until after oh, was 1920s, and it was Canada after that. Anyway, what's going on in Germany? They have these potassium mines. By that time, potassium had been identified as an element. People knew they needed it in plants. They knew there was pretty substantial quantities in plants. Um, and it became quite a popular fertilizer material. Well, about 1870s, 1880s, the German states unified and became a country. Part of that, they were just a bunch of little kingdoms. Germany was a bunch of little kingdoms. And um, eventually, by the turn of the uh, 20th century, Germany had actually nationalized the potassium mines. They had taken them away from the private owners, and, and the government owned them. OK, so we're, we're going towards World War I now. Things aren't going really well. So what does Germany do? Germany puts an embargo on their potassium. And they, by about 1914, they said, hey, we're not selling any more to you all. Right? So people had gotten dependent on it. They saw that it was a good nutrient source. They saw that some soils really responded to it and grew better crops. And all of a sudden, the supply is cut off. So there was no more mine until after, from Germany until after the war. It was at that point that the USGS says, look, guys, we got similar kinds of geological environments on North America. Go out and find some. So there was a lot of exploration in the late 19-teens and 1920s looking for deposits in the United States in a similar kind of geologic environment. So this whole thing of a country putting on an embargo and not allowing nutrients out of strategic material or any other strategic material, could be chromium, could be titanium, is an important one because back prior to World War I, we saw a country do that. I won't sell you any more of our potassium. We keep it. All right. Um, so hence that peak phosphorus, Morocco, the part, the part with the phosphorus mines was actually taken over from other people who really didn't give it up to you. They're not happy with it. There might be a revolution. Folks are a little concerned about that. So right now, the deposits in Germany are, are not used primarily for North America. They're, they're still used in Europe, but we get um, our potassium from Canada. And by the way, it was after the um, geological exploration uh, that went out, discovered uh, potassium mines near, near the beautiful caves in uh, Carlsbad in, in uh, southeastern New Mexico. So for a while, uh, that was mined. Uh, but that's pretty much mined out now. I don't think anything's being taken out of the Carlsbad mines, although the caves near it are gorgeous. Anybody here been to Carlsbad? Beautiful, beautiful caves. If you want to see the Grand Canyon, stop first in southeastern New Mexico and see Carlsbad Caverns. They are spectacular. <coughs> OK, so energy inputs. Uh, it takes a huge amount of energy to make nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, because number one, we use um, natural gas. We crack it and get the hydrogen from it. Then we have to use energy to produce those extremely high temperatures and extremely high pressures. So it takes uh, 45 gigajoules per ton to make nitrogen. But uh, rock phosphate, it's not quite as energy intensive. It's quite insoluble, so it has to be acidified. Okay? So sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid that you previously made from your rock phosphate are used to acidify it. Uh, Potassium is even simpler. It basically, as it's mined in all the deposits, uh, major commercial deposits to date, it coexists with sodium chloride, and you need to get the sodium out of it. So that can be done by flotation or differential uh, solution. So there's some processing to this, uh, but nowhere near as much as there is for the acidification of rock phosphate or the huge amounts of energy that are needed to get the hydrogen, pure hydrogen, pure nitrogen, high temperature, and high pressure that we need for nitrogen fertilizer production. 
So there's your fertilizer technology section here. Okay. Now let's understand what we look at when we look at a label. What does a label mean? You've all seen labels 10, 10, 10, 624, 0, 0060, whatever. What do those numbers mean? This is all codified in state regulations. Every state in the United States and most of the countries in the developed world have a fertilizer law that dictates what those numbers mean. And we pretty much agree across North America and Europe. I don't know about Asia. The first number always means percent nitrogen. The second number always means percent phosphate, not phosphorus, and they're not the same. Right? The third number always means pot ash. Why pot ash? Remember, it used to be the ash at the bottom of the pot after you leach plant materials and blew all the water off. Right? That's where it got its name. Not phosphorus, not potassium, and they're not interchangeable. Phosphate and phosphorus are different things. Right? There are different ways of expressing it, but they're not mathematically equivalent. Potassium and potash, you can inter, inter convert them, but they're not equivalent. Okay, So just think about your vocabulary. When you're talking to other producers and farmers, too, it's important. Okay, so percent nitrogen. Now, that's a total nitrogen. It's not a plant-available nitrogen. It's a total nitrogen. Remember I talked about people immortalizing themselves? Well, there was a Swedish chemist called Keldahl that came up with a process to um, analyze nitrogen and stuff. And we tend to call his method the Keldahl nitrogen. We say, oh, I'm going to run, I'm going to run Keldahl nitrogens today. It's named for him, all right, with very little modification of what he did initially. Complicated for us when we use organic sources because it isn't necessarily what's available. In commercial fertilizer, it may be, in commercial synthetic fertilizer, but you get into organics and it's probably not plant available. So it means that as users of organic materials, we often have to do a secondary calculation to figure out what's actually plant available. And we've you've done that a couple times now. With the phosphate, it's not water soluble, it's what's called citrate soluble. I don't know the history here, I don't know why they chose this, I just know that that again is codified, and that is how phosphorus fertilizers are evaluated. And with potash, it's essentially what's soluble. All right. Now, talk about conversion. And this is fair game for the test, right? There very often is a test where you're at a question where you're asked to convert from either um, phosphate to phosphorus or potash to potassium or the reverse, phosphorus to phosphate and potassium to potash. Talk about gimmicks. There's a gimmick here. So let's let's figure out what this is because you really only have to learn two numbers, all right? There's five oxygens here to two phosphorus. There's one oxygen here to two potassiums. So of these two important numbers, 0.44 and 0.83, you have to see the reason why this would go with something where the phosphorus is more diluted out by oxygen in the way we express it. And that's all it is. It's a means of expressing it. Whereas here, there's one oxygen to two potassiums. So do you see why the 0.44 would be used with this conversion and the 0.83 would be used with this? Is that clear? Okay. Now, this number is nothing more than the inverse of that. So if you go one divided by this, you get that. And if you go one divided by this, you get that. So the only need to learn two numbers, 0.44 and 0.83. And the fact is, you can learn 0.44 and say, well, the other one's approximately double. Because this is going to be a multiple choice test. And one place in the hundreds isn't going to change your answer that much. OK? So if they say, OK, something's got 5% phosphorus in it, how would it be labeled as a fertilizer? Well, OK. Use this to get that. This is considered fair game interconverting back and forth between the elemental and the oxide basis. Now realize that there's none of either of these two things in a bag of fertilizer, even though they may have numbers in the second and third places. It is simply a means of expressing what's there. And I know this is ludicrously confusing, but I think I know why. These are mined materials. Phosphorus and potassium were mined materials. And at that point in time, most of the methods we had for determining chemical composition of things at all was done in an aerobic environment by gravimetric or some kind of solution methods. And in the end, you got the oxide of whatever it was you purified everything else from. So historically, ores were described, and they still are described in geology books, as the oxide of something. 
Well, these were geological materials. These were ores. And they were traditionally analyzed in that mold by that field and by that industry. And it just carried over into their use once they were expressed as fertilizers. It does not mean there's any P2O5 in the bag or any K2O in the bag. The fact is, most potassium fertilizers, potassium chloride, it's KCL. This is just a means of expressing it. And if you've taken gravimetric chemistry, analytical chemistry, you did these conversions back and forth with all kinds of things. It is simply a means of expressing what's there. It doesn't mean that that thing actually is present there in that form. I will say that there was an effort in the 60s and 70s to change fertilizer labels to the elements, like NPK instead of N-phosphate potash. It floundered. All right. Some laws actually, some states actually passed laws that said you had to have dual labeling where the N phosphate potash was in big numbers and the NPK was below it. That, that's all gone away now. One of the reasons is it makes it look like you have more if you express it as an oxide. And quite frankly, not to offend any companies here, but the people that made this stuff didn't want folks to think there was less nutrient in it. So the, um, the industry encouraged, uh, strongly encouraged leaving things the way they were. Okay. A Kalmaner analysis tells you that uh, potassium percent is 0.5%. What is the percent potash content? Okay, good, very good. Okay, well we know it's, we know it's half of a percent even as potassium. So we know it can't be these two, right? Because it isn't going to be less as K2O than it is as K, right? Because K2O expands what you look like you have, OK? And um, we know that our conversion factor in this case is what? What's our conversion factor? OK, 1.2. So you know, I think we got a pretty good idea. We can certainly eliminate this because it's almost it's more than double, right? So you wouldn't even need to do any math on here. You could just look at these answers and know that, that it has to be C. It can't be less than what you start with because the oxide ex exploits, in essence, what you think you have. And it can't be more than double that. Right? So in fact, our answer is 0.5 times 1.23, or it's 0.6% uh, potash. Okay. You have 60 pounds of phosphate. How many pounds of phosphorus is that equivalent to? Okay. Now in this case, you're going to gear it down, right? Because expressing it as an element makes it look like you have less than expressing it as an oxide. So let's let's look at that one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We know it can't be three. We know it can't be. Uh, we know it can't be C or D because they're actually more than this. And we know that whatever we do, it's going to be less than what we start with. All right. So yeah, uh, the conversion factor is 0.44, roughly roughly half. So I think we could have estimated pretty clearly that. Again, without even getting our calculator out, that this had to be our right answer because that's way more than half of 60. Okay, so know those two factors. Um, understand that element, elemental expression is, is makes it look like you have less than oxide expression, and phosphates diluted with five oxygens to two phosphorus. So the, the uh, smaller the conversion numbers need to be associated with that. Okay, so let's talk about some common nitrogen fertilizers. Ammonia still used. Um, a lot in, in the United States. Let's use some on the shore where our soils are sandier and not rocky. Um, it's a gas under pressure, so when you use it, it has to be knifed in, and your knife slit has to be covered up behind it, or you're going to lose your gas out into the atmosphere. Because once it reaches atmospheric pressure, it goes from the liquid it is in the tank to a gas. All right? So still used on the shore, used a lot in the Midwest on soils that aren't rocky. The, um, it tends to not be used in rocky areas because, you, again, you have to inject it, and rocks are very hard on your injection equipment. Ammonium nitrate used to be a very popular fertilizer. It was a bit of a pain because it really did absorb moisture and cake up. It became a problem if you couldn't keep it dry, but we have an even bigger problem with ammonium nitrate. Anybody tell me what that is? Baboon. <laughs> yes, it was used uh, for the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, it's been used since for other bombings, and it is now under the control of Homeland Security. Most fertilizer companies won't deal with it because of the restrictions put onto its storage. It's as bad as a storage you need in a nuclear site. All right. Um, you have to. You can only sell it to people that have a Homeland Security card. So everybody's been cleared to buy it. 
Um, the record keeping is astronomical, again, because they don't want any of it to get out. So most fertilizer companies have said, the hell with it, we're not selling it. So it's not illegal to sell, it's just the restrictions for selling it are so onerous that most fertilizer companies won't, won't deal with it anymore. It's not illegal to sell it as a fertilizer, however. Right. Urea is the most common product, and that makes a lot of sense. It's 4600. For every ton of stuff you're shipping around or loading into your fertilizer spreader or hauling to the field, you're getting more nitrogen. 46 is good. Ammonium sulfate is still used by some people. I know folks in the Piedmont love it on their hay fields. They put one of their nitrogen applications on as ammonium sulfate because they believe they need the sulfur. All right. So if you think you need both, that's a good choice, but it's much less nitrogen here, less than half the nitrogen is urea. And then there's all the UAN solutions, 28003000, and what you use is dependent upon how cold your climate is. Right? The 32% stuff would, would uh, precipitate out in Minnesota. Right? Are the efficiency of all nitrogen fertilizers the same? No, we've got the same problem with putting nitrogen, ammonium bearing nitrogen fertilizers on the uh, surface as we do with um, uh, manure, it can volatilize, particularly if it's warm and dry. So yes, there are losses. Studies have shown, though, that if you're banding urea, even in the warm weather, there's no um, substantial difference uh, between the different sources. There's some less common things out there, but they tend to be used in specialty markets, like uh, the, the landscape people might like this. Sulfur-coated urea has been around a long time, so is urea form. This is formaldehyde. Um, mixed with urea. It slows down the release. All of these are slow release materials and they're quite popular in the turf industry. If you can put an application out that is slow released and you can cut another trip to that client's house, right, you're saving money. Right? So they've been willing to pay more per unit nitrogen because they save on the labor of an additional application of a water-soluble fertilizer. So all of these are slow release for one reason or another. These because they're, they've been chemically altered some way to slow their release. This one because the urea granules are literally coated with sulfur. And until bacteria oxidize that sulfur and make some holes in the coating, the water can't get in and the nitrogen can't get out. Some common phosphorus fertilizers. Used to be superphosphate was the big kid on the block. Then we came up with triple superphosphate 046. Whenever you get higher analysis stuff, it's popular because you've got less stuff to handle for the same nutrient benefit. So that was very popular for a while. It's to the point now where you have to special order it if you want it. Uh, DAP, diammonium phosphate, is, is the number one phosphorus material used in America today. Some, some NAP, some mono, uh, mono ammonium phosphate, but mostly diammonium. And then there's also some ammonium polyphosphates, particularly in the liquid fertilizer industry. Potassium. The majority of the potassium fertilizer used in the United States is muriate potash. It's the same stuff that's in no salt in the grocery store, potassium chloride. It's just a little pure stuff in the grocery store, okay? But it's basically the same stuff, 0060. Um, it's the cheapest product. If, pound per pound of potassium, unless you're growing a chloride-sensitive crop, tobacco's a chloride-sensitive crop, there are some other chloride-sensitive crops, you're going to use muriate of potash because it's cheaper. So there are some other products out there, there's sulfate of potash, and then there's these other products too, potassium, magnesium sulfate that's sold by a product called Sulfomag, and potassium nitrate. This is the number one though, cheapest, cheapest. Okay, now let's talk about types of materials. There's solids, there's fluids. Okay, solids can be granular or they can be bulk blend. Granular means that the, the products from which they're made were mixed as liquids and then they were precipitated out as, um, as particles, granules. And the benefit of that is, is that every granule has the, uh, roughly the same amount of nutrient in it. Right? So you mix your DAP with your potassium chloride and a big vat and then you sprayed it out and made granules. All right, well there's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in every little green. That's good. Bulk blend is different. Bulk blend means you got a factory, you got some bins of stuff, you mix it together, right? Put it on a truck, you bounce down the road. Bouncing down the road tends to cause things to separate. If they're not the same density and not the same size. So bulk blend was very popular for a while, but some people had very bad experiences with it. 
You know, they left 30 miles away down some really crappy roads, and by the time the stuff got there, it wasn't mixed at all anymore, right? So under the right conditions, and, and people go to a lot of companies, fertilizer companies, go to great um, effort to make sure that things are similar size, because there's less segregation than when it's blended. So I think most of the problems that we saw initially have been worked out. Then fluids. You can have solutions where everything is in solution, clear liquid, but you can also have suspensions that are basically slurries. So there's a whole variety of products out there, depending upon um, whether you're applying it, whether your company's applying it, whether they can put other stuff in it or not. Fluids have the benefit of being able to uh, apply some other uh, materials in too that you might want at the same time. So you can blend fertilizers, and, and blending fertilizers is certainly a potential question, but you've got, uh, what, 100 questions in two hours? I'd let this point go. I do want to tell you, however, though, that you can do it. If you look at what analysis you're looking for and you look at what products you might have available, it's not that hard to work through how much of each of these you might need to make up this blend. So in this case, if you want triple 19 and you have your Readap and Myriad of Potash out there in the bin, in fact, you need 500 pounds of the urea, uh, 826 pounds of the DAP, and 633 pounds of potash per ton of stuff. Now, when you add those together, they're not 2,000 pounds. So you have to add something to make up the ton, all right? And it depends upon where you are in the United States. In some places, they use a coarse lime. In some places, they use sand. But this is what's actually called a filler. And a filler is a product, an inert pretty inert product that's used in blended fertilizers to make up to the amount <coughs> that you're guaranteeing. Oh, I want a ton of this. Well, he it means a ton. Plus, if, if you skim too much, you don't get exactly the same analysis either. So in blended dry fertilizers, there, there can be fillers, nutrient inert materials to help meet the fertilizer guarantee. Now we're going to get to an idea that annoys me, and that is people saying there's filler in muriated potash. There's no filler in muriate potash, okay? There's potassium ion and there's chloride ion, but there's no filler in there. It's all muriate potash, all right? It's all, remember, nothing's a pure, no fertilizer's a pure nutrient. There's other things in the compound. And in this case, there's chlor chloride in there with the potassium. But we haven't added anything else to make up to weight. It's just the other element in the compound, all right? So, one more slide just to talk about filler a little bit more. When you make meatloaf, why are you eating meatloaf? Why is meatloaf on the table? Well, no, protein, right? You're eating it for the protein. Now you're getting some fat, but you're probably not eating it for the fat, right? But the fat's there, all right? You know, you also put in some seasoning, and so maybe you put in oatmeal or breadcrumbs. Now why do you put in the oatmeal and the breadcrumbs? Hold it together, why else? Stretch it out. That's right. You grew up in a family like mine. You did it to extend the amount of stuff so you could feed more people and they were all full. That's filler. Okay? So the oatmeal or the breadcrumbs is filler. It's stuff in, in this case, to spread it out. In the case of fertilizer, it's stuff to put in to make it up to the weight you're making. All right? There's filler here. There is no filler here. There's just the other element in the compound with the nutrient. Okay. So some application terminology, a lot, of, a lot of terms. Broadcast, spread it out. Can be liquid, can be, can be solid, doesn't make any difference. Top dress, top dress means we're putting it on an existing crop, it's already up. Right. Side dress, we do that in corn. We get on the row six inches beside, put out some fertilizer at, uh, when it's young. Side dress, starter, that's typically put down with the planter. Sometimes right near the seed, that's pop-up. Sometimes two inches down, two inches over. Fertigation, fertilizer put into an irrigation system. Incorporation, ooh, very broad definition. You're putting your stuff out and you're doing some activity to mix it partially or wholly in the soil. But it can be pretty partial under today's uh, equipment options. All right? Or it can be total. Injection, put below the surface, like with anhydrous ammonia or like liquid swine manure. If you've got neighbors near you, you want to be sure you can inject your liquid swine manure. Anybody here smell liquid, smell liquid swine manure? You want it injected, okay? <laughs> okay. So, you might have a nutrient management plan that tells you, oh, you need a certain amount of a nutrient, right? So, look at it, read it, and then see what you can get your hands on, what's available. 
Have they sold out of the product you really want? Do you have to get something else? Is there a difference in price between product A and product B? Which is the more economical choice? How do you know what it has in it? Look at the label. All right? And then finally, you can figure out how much of that product you use to meet the nutrient requirements of the nutrient management plan. So let's look at an example. This person's growing soybeans, all right? You don't need nitrogen on soybeans, and his phosphorus is already in a range where no more is recommended. He'd like to use myriad of potash, 0060. How much pot myriad of potash does he need to apply 90 pounds of potash? All right, well, let's look at this. This is one way to do it. If you know how to do this, great. If you don't, this is a help. First thing, what's recommended? 90 pounds. What's the percent nutrient in my product? 60%. Express the nutrient content as a decimal fraction, and then divide the recommendation by the amount of nutrient expressed as a decimal fraction. And in fact, to get 90 pounds of potash from the 0060 product, he needs 150 pounds of product. Now, if you're getting, if people who get plants from extension are only told pounds of nitrogen phosphate potash. If, if you're a company, like you guys over there, doing a nutrient management plan, you may also be selling product. I don't know if you are or not. No, okay, not. you're not. Uh, if you're not selling product, you've got to be careful of, of recommending specific products, particularly if you're a university, right? Because you can't show preference for one vendor or one product over another. So we just say pounds of nitrogen, pounds of phosphate, pounds of potash, and then you, the client, needs to go out and find what's available, what is the cost, what do I want to use based on cost and availability, and then calculate how much product they actually need. Okay, a producer wants to apply 60 pounds of nitrogen to his orchard grass. Um, if he uses ammonium sulfate, how much material should be applied per acre? Okay, exactly. We know, it, we know it can't be this one because we know um, that no material is 100% nutrient. We also know that 21% is about a fifth, so if you multiply 5 times 60, you, you know pretty much right away that this has got to be your answer. All right? So yeah, be able to do that on the exam. If 60 pounds is recommended, product is 21%, you're going to do a decimal fraction, divide the 60 by 0.21, and you get 285. Wonderful. Now, we have entered into a phenomenally interesting era of enhanced efficiency fertilizer. And this is what most of you are going to be dealing with during your professional lives. They're designed to increase what we call nutrient use efficiency. We put a lot of nutrients out there that don't, don't get taken up by the crop. What can we do to enhance the efficiency of their use? All right? So there's a variety of ways people have tried to do this. We know that ammonium is a more stable form in soil than nitrate is. All right? Nitrate leaches, ammonium doesn't. So one of the first things that was tried, and we've got 40 years of data on this, was to add something that kills the nitrifiers. All right? Those are called nitrification inhibitors. Uh, we also know that uh, if we add urea materials to the soil, we can, it can um, break down into uh, ammonia, and it volatilizes. But we also know that there's an enzyme involved in there, and we can inhibit that enzyme. So we can add urease inhibitors. Right? We can also try to chemically shield the fertilizer granule, put something around it, like this sulfur-coated urea that protect it from solution. Or we can envelop it in a semi-permeable membrane, all right? something that slows down its dissolution by reducing the rate at which water can attack it. And those are the primary mechanisms whereby we can um, attempt to, use, to make fertilizers more efficient. So first, these nitrification inhibitors. Most of them work by, by killing the bacteria that oxidize ammonia to nitrite. This can be added to fertilizer. It can be added to liquid fertilizer or sprayed on solid. They're very specific bactericides that apparently only kill this kind of creature. Right? Now these are archaea. They're the ancient, ancient bacteria. So they're enough different from the more recent, relatively speaking. They can kill them without killing everybody. The problem is that even these compounds are organic compounds, and they too are going to be metabolized by organisms and destroyed after them. So they only work for a limited amount of time. Then there's the urease inhibitors. 
In order to get urease, uh, in order to use it as ammonia, urease has to be present for this conversion. So if you can do something to block the action of that enzyme, all right, you can stop this reaction. And that's exactly what urease inhibitors do. They block the reaction sites on, on, the, on, um, on urease so they cannot facilitate this reaction. They don't work that long. <laughs> maybe two weeks, maybe a week or two, all right? And not some years they're not effective. And here's what I mean by not effective. This is a problem, you, you lose your nitrogen, particularly in hot, warm, you know, hot, hot, dry conditions on the surface. But if you put your urea out and it rains that night, you didn't need a urea inhibitor because the rain dissolved it and washed it into the soil. So it's, it's a way of managing your risk of loss, but it may not always pay off in the sense of actually making more nitrogen there. Is it a good idea? Hey, if I was putting nitrogen on grass in the summer around here, as irregular as our rain is, I'd invest in a nitrification inhibitor because that's the time when it's most likely to pay off. Now you as a consumer may not have a choice. It turns out that some companies put this in everything, sell it all year round, but it may not help, okay? All right, chemically shielded. There's a product out there called a veil, and it has a coating on it, and it's all proprietary, so I don't know what it is. But anyway, um, it, it helps um, allow the phosphorus to be um, more, more reactive in the soil, get out there, not get reacted with iron or aluminum or calcium because of this shield whose composition is unknown. All right, does it work? Um, uh, there's not a huge amount of work that's been done on efficacy. Um, I, again, in some of the products sold in Maryland by some vendors, everything has a veil um, use for its phosphorus component. I'm not sure it's worthwhile because, in a, especially in a high pea soil, do you want to protect what you're adding in addition to that? Do you need that? You know, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on knowing where some of these things pay off. And they may, perhaps they shouldn't be blanket applications of a, of a, a process, and they should be used more selectively. All right. Then there's this one. This is another very interesting one, uh, environmentally smart nitrogen. It's coated with a polymer. Again, this is all proprietary. So anyway, it's a semi-permeable membrane. Stuff gets in slowly. It may have tiny, tiny holes. The water gets in, it dissolves stuff, and then stuff can diffuse out. So um, it allows you, for example, to put with, with uh, studies done in Delaware on corn, uh, looking at all your nitrogen put out pre-plant, um, conventional nitrogen, all your nitrogen put out pre-plant with ESN and split applying it, they found that most years this was in between the two in terms of yield, all right? It was still better to split apply, but it does have some modicum of protection. One thing we have to real about, realize about these highly engineered things is um, they were designed for the huge markets in the United States, the Midwest. And our climate's a little bit warmer and our season's a little bit longer. So they may not be ideally suited to our conditions. We're not the big market. All right? You should be aware of this whole approach, the International um, Plant Nutrition Institute, formerly the Phosphate Potash Institute, they reworked themselves, has tremendous emphasis right now on the four R's. All right? They want, there, there's enough concern about nutrients in the environment from agriculture that they, as an educational group and as a group that represents the industries, producing fertilizer and selling fertilizer, know that it behooves them to talk to their client base about the four R's. Use the right product. Use urea with a, a urease inhibitor in the summer on grass, okay? Use the right uh, rates, you know? Use, put it out at the right time. Put it out in the right place. There's a tremendous amount of information on the IPNI website. There's fact sheets, there's videos, lots and lots of information to help us and our uh, clients understand this approach. A couple, couple slides on lime. Uh, a lot of the lime used here is dolomitic lime because that's what's uh, uh, mined uh, close to us. Uh, calcitic lime also, uh, I have to special order that when I want it. There are several ways of expressing the concentration or the power of lime. Nationwide, the most popular way is the calcium carbonate equivalent, even though in Maryland we still use percent oxides. So you can see that dolomitic limestone is, is about 9% more powerful ton per ton than calcitic limestone. Both of these are relatively um, slow reacting. Um, there are two other products you might encounter, burnt lime, which is calcium oxide, and slaked lime, which is calcium hydroxide. They are much more powerful in terms of pound per pound, all right? 
they are also um, they also have a disadvantage. They react they react much more quickly. If you had a high value crop in a low pH soil and you wanted to plant that crop this year and your pH was too low, uh, you might want to invest in verd or slaked lime. Other than that, I wouldn't bother. All right. What thing you have to be careful about if someone wants to use these products, they have to understand that they're not equivalent. A ton of regular limestone is equivalent to about nine tenths of a ton of dolomitic limestone. That difference is probably within the error of application rate. I wouldn't worry about it. But this one I would worry about, and this one I would worry about. It's only uh, 55 hundredths of a ton of burnt lime and 75 hundredths of a ton of slate lime. You add the same rate of this as the recommendation says of that, and you can overline. Remember, we talked about why we don't want to overline. So if you start using these other materials at the same rate, you can run into overlining. Let's see. This one's exothermic. It's actually used in a lot of the uh, lime stabilized sludges to make it hot as well as um, increase the pH. Calcium hydroxide is extremely caustic. I was at a soccer game a couple years ago uh, watching the child of some good friends of mine, and one of the kids on the team slid into that edge and, you know, where they marked the white lines, and the kids started screaming. You know, it turns out that whoever marked it, marked it was with a, a caustic line, probably this one. And it really, it, it burns on, on skin that you've just scraped on the skin off of as this kid did. One of the things we need to be aware of with uh, lime is the particle size. The finer it is, the more surface area it's exposed to water, the quicker it's going to dissolve. Maryland's Lime Law says that it has to be, it has to be labeled to show you what percent passes a 20 mesh screen, a 60 mesh screen, and a 100 mesh screen. And that is nothing more than 20 wires per inch, 60 wires per inch, 100 wires per inch. So essentially, if you send a weird lab, uh, weird lime material into our ag lab, they have a set of sieves, and they'll put it in the top, put it on the shaker, and see what's caught on every sieve. It's a really fun procedure. You definitely want to have a mechanical shaker for this. Okay, you know, I have to do it by hand, All right? And uh, here's a uh, oldie but goodie, but it tells you how quickly things react depending upon their particle size: two weeks, six months, a year, two years, three years. Or you start out, well, five, one, maybe, okay. You, if it's all less than 100, which is super fine, whoa, that reacts pretty fast, okay? No lime at all. If you hadn't done anything, it would have continued to go down. Remember, we're on that downward spiral of the roller coaster. Uh, 30, uh, 20 to 30, minus size, comes up kind of slow, drops off. 40 to 60, comes up a little faster. So most lime materials are a mixture of all three. So you get some fast reaction, some slower reaction. But you tend to get help for a couple of years much like we saw in that data that we looked at yesterday. Soil amendments and soil conditioners, um, these are materials for which no nutrient claim may be made. That is, they're not labeled as a fertilizer, all right? But they contain, if they contain nutrients, you as nutrient management planners or people looking at nutrient management plans need to know that they should be included in a plan. The fact that there was no um, nutrient guarantee provided and it wasn't registered as a fertilizer does not mean you can ignore it in a nutrient management plan. So we have things out there, chicken processing waste, we have a lot of that. We have some vegetable processing waste, we have some whey from ice cream and cottage cheese plants. We have a number of sources of these amendments or conditioners in Maryland. And if, if your client is using them, those materials should be integrated into your plan. Any questions?